one of these days I'm just going to get my Bible and go to children's church. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I better wait until after uh, God's through with me. <laughs> All right. Would you please open your Bibles to the Gospel of John? We still have guest speakers with us every week, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Today we're in the Gospel of John, chapter 2, and we're going to begin reading at the verse 13. I'm continuing the series on the life and times of Jesus Christ. And uh, I hope that you'll be here for the entire series because we're going to go through all of the major stories in the life of Jesus from uh, before his birth, through his birth, and all the way to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So uh, don't, don't miss a Sunday, you're going to miss out. How many of you went to Sunday school this morning? Oh, good. I like that. If you missed Sunday school today, don't cry about it. I just want to encourage you to plan to go to Sunday school next week. You know what happens at Sunday school? That's how you get to know people in classes, in small groups. That's also where when you have a need, you can share it with your small group, your class, and they will pray with you and minister to you and minister as they do to one another. And uh, when somebody else needs help, guess what? We need you. So the best way for you to get to know people and to find ministry or to minister to someone else and to learn from the Bible is in a small group Bible study. And we call it Sunday school. If you want to call it adult Bible study, then you can call it adult Bible study. That's what it is. Just when brothers and sisters get together, and if you're if you're here today and you say, you know, I'm not a believer, go to Sunday school. That's where you're going to get to ans ask your questions. Amen. Whatever question you got, you go and ask them in that small group, and they will help you. There are people in our classes that would help you if you had any question. So you go to Sunday school, okay? Now, you ready to stand? Let's stand and read. Uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verse 13. And let's pray first. Father, we're asking you to speak to us. We want to hear your voice. So Lord, uh, speak to our hearts now as we read your word. And help us to understand what we're supposed to learn out of this passage today. And we thank you for helping us. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're in John chapter 2, beginning in verse 13. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and he found at, in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers doing business. When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen, and poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise or business. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house has eaten me up. So the Jews answered and said to Jesus, What sign do you show up to us since you do all these things? Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, it has taken 46 years to build, actually it was to rebuild this temple. Will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. You may be seated. Something that's very important for us to remember True faith 
always results in faithfulness. When somebody says to me, I'm a Christian, or I'm born again, or I pray to receive Jesus Christ, one of the ways that I can see the fruit or the evidence of that decision in their life is a life of faithfulness. Faithfulness means that a person uh, reads the Word of God, is an active in worship and in prayer, and when they read the Word of God, they apply it to their life. We call that obey. They, they obey what the Word of God tells them to do. That's evidence that a person is truly born again or has true faith. And I want us to take a look at this passage because we prayed for God to speak to us so we could learn some things. First thing I want us to do is to remember that God rescued us from slavery to sin. We should never forget that. Every time you see the word Passover uh, or we come to the Lord's table, we ought to stop and remember the reason why we would come to the table is to remember Jesus Christ gave his life for you and for me, and he delivered us, saved us from, rescued us from bondage to sin. He set us free. So when we come to the table and remember his body broken for us and his blood which was spilled out, poured out for us, we should remember that Jesus Christ did that to save us from our own sin. Now it says, and he went up to Jerusalem. Remember where he was before? Last week he was in Cana of Galilee. And I want to take a quick look here. That's what Cana of Galilee looks like today. Kind of rolling hills and uh, a lot of little little houses there built on the hills. And he went from this place, which is near the Sea of Galilee. I'll show you a map where that is. This is, uh, this is the region of Galilee. Here's the Sea of Galilee, that little blue place there where there's water, and the Jordan River runs all the way down straight through the center, you're down to the Dead Sea, and here's uh, Capernaum, and here's uh, uh, the Mount of Beatitudes is up here, here's Cana of Galilee, so if you want to find Cana, just take the Sea of Galilee and go toward the Mediterranean, go west, and there's Cana about halfway, and then down here is Jerusalem, all this way, and you can find Jerusalem by going to the Dead Sea, and just go west of the of the of the sea of, of the Dead Sea, and you'll find Jerusalem. So we find it's high. There's a mountain ridge that runs up and down through the center of Jerusalem of Israel, and uh, the one of the highest places on Mount Zion is where the city of Jerusalem is. So when it says he uh, went up, it means he literally went from a lower elevation up. And he, he walked about 50 miles. I don't know the exact distance, but it's about 50 miles. So the little words, he went up to Jerusalem, means he took a walk for 50 miles. My guess is he didn't do that in a day. He probably took several days with he and the, his entourage to go from Cana on up to, to uh, Jerusalem. Now this is an artist's depiction. This is something like what the city would look like when Jesus Christ arrived at the city of Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city of peace. There was a temple mount here. There was a place where people could come into the temple from this elevation, or they could come up all these steps on the west side, or on the south side, they could come up these uh, steps here and come up into this inside, and then there was a stairway which would lead them up to the level here and the temple was sitting up here on this high place and so the temple with the holy of holies would be here let me show you from this is looking at it from the west side let me look at it from the east side from the east side the temple would be here the entrance would be open to the east uh, toward the uh, uh, Mount, Mount of Olives from which this picture would be taken would be from the Mount of Olives looking down on what it would look like on Temple Mount then, okay? <laughs> That's what it would look like. That's where Jesus came, and if he came down, he would come down the road and then come into the city, and he ended up here, standing, uh-oh, uh-huh, right there, standing here in the temple. Now, this is that temple that was on top. Let me see. This is this. That's the temple, and this would be the doors into the temple, Jesus Christ was at the temple, probably out in the courtyard there, and he was 
teaching the people there, just a little idea of what it looked like when he came there to speak to them in Jerusalem. Second thing, not only should we remember God rescued us from slavery to sin, but second, don't let other things distract you from worship. Isn't it easy for us to get distracted today? There are so many other things that could say, well, I'm, I can't go to worship God because you fill in the blank. What's the reason you're not at Sunday school? Why is the reason you're not at church? Well, I have other things i got to do. I mean, I, I work during the week, and on Sunday is my only day off. i got to get the laundry done, and i got to go shopping at Walmart, and i gotta, I got to wash the car, and i got to do these other things, right? And you're all here. I'm talking to the choir. You're the faithful ones that are here today. <laughs> we need to pray sometimes for the ones. I think we ought to just stop and pray. For the ones who are not here today that should be here to worship God. Let's pray. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. And on our heart are those who are not with us this morning. I want to pray that each man, woman, boy and girl especially those who say that they know you, would realize you are more important than anything else in the world or the universe. It's a privilege for us to have freedom to come and to worship together as we choose to do. And I want to pray that you'll put it on the hearts of others who know you or say that they know you, that they might want to come and to worship you with their brothers and sisters. And for those who do not know you, I pray, bring conviction upon them that they need Jesus Christ in their life. Because without Jesus, there really is no life. We pray that in Christ's name. Amen. The Lord says you have not because you ask not. So we need to just stop and pray when it's on our mind. Don't let other things distract you. Jesus came to the temple when he came up to, the, up to Jerusalem. And it says, and he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. And the main purpose of the temple is worship. That's why I highlighted the word worship. What is worship? Worship is uh, ascribing worth to God. It's recognizing who God is and who we are as his creatures, his creation. And we worship him because he's worthy of our worship. He's God who created us and loved us and gave his son for us. So main purpose of the temple, all that you saw, all that construction they had there in Jerusalem, the reason they built all that is because it was an important thing for them to do was to go to the place of worship. And the temple represented the presence of God. So what they were doing, all those steps, people were coming up on the west and on the east and so forth, they were all coming to worship God. And every year when it was Passover, all the males of Israel were obligated to go, if they were able, to Jerusalem to worship God during Passover. To remember God had passed over them and allowed them to live, delivered them from Egypt. And so worship is the main purpose. They uh, collected temple tax in the local currency because when all these people came from around Israel and even from other nations to Jerusalem to worship God, they had foreign money with them oftentimes. And they were not supposed to use foreign money because foreign money had pagan faces on it. The face of a Roman emperor, for example, or some other nation. It might have the, the face of their king on it. And they said that was pagan. So they had to change their money for temple coins in order to make an offering of temple money at the temple. The only thing was, you'd bring your $5 worth of U.S. money and they'd say, it's going to cost you $10 to get $5 of temple money. Okay? And so what they would do is charge you a ridiculously high rate for exchange for the temple money. That was one thing they're doing. The second thing that they did is they sold animals for sacrifice. So if you were a traveler and you were traveling by foot and you got there and you needed an animal, you might bring your, uh, your old goat or whatever up there to, to sacrifice at the temple and they might say it's not good enough. It's not perfect. It has a blemish. You're going to have to get rid of that old goat and you're going to have to get a sacrifice goat, one that's white, 
no spots, and it's going to cost you 500 bucks to get a uh, spotless goat. But my other goat's are only worth 100 bucks. I know that a spotless goat's worth 500. So they were making profit off of the sale of animals to be sacrificed instead of doing whatever they could to make it easy for people to come to worship. They tried to make profit off of it. It was no longer a not-for-profit. It was a for-profit operation going on at the temple. By the way, I think this was the first time that Jesus Christ cleared the temple. There are other records in uh, the other Gospels later, and I'll just list them. There's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. These are four times in the Gospels it's mentioned that he clears the temple. It's interesting. This one is in, in the Gospel of John is early in his ministry, and the other three are late in his ministry. I don't know if you ever noticed that before. I'm just going to leave them up. You can write them down. Read them. You'll see a little bit of a different perspective about the clearing of the temple in each passage. Some, some, uh, some of the uh, Bible scholars believe that he did it twice. Some believe for some reason he put this earlier in the story. All I know is he got to the temple. They were making profit, taking advantage, and he cleared it out. And whether he did it once or twice... The point is, he did it. He, he didn't like them doing that. And the third thing is, you and I will see people committing sin from time to time. And it is offensive, is it not? Sin is offensive. Who is it mostly offensive to? God. So we should be angry over sin, but we should not take our, hear me clearly, our personal offenses Let's say somebody offends me. I should not be so offended or take offense at what someone did or said or I thought they said. And nearly compared to the offense we should share with God over the lack of righteousness. Offenses against God. Sin is a big deal. But we, you and I, should not take offense over the little mistakes or things that other people do because of their humanity. We need to guard against it. Don't get equally angry about every single thing that comes along your way that bothers you. It says that Jesus took this whip of cords, he made one, and drove them all out of there. That's one of the reasons we try to avoid doing business that interferes with people coming and going into the church. It's a principle. It's about making it easy for people to come in to worship. That's the point. And he said to those who sold doves, he said, take these things away. Don't make my father's house a house of merchandise. In another gospel, he says, my father's house is a house of prayer. It's a pray, a pray of worship to God and sharing with God. So Jesus was angry about this. Make sure, though, that you don't misuse anger at other people and raise your little hurts and offenses to the same equal standard as God, okay? It's okay and it's right for us to be angry with injustice, especially I, I get angry more about injustice to others than offenses to me. But don't get so bent out of shape about minor little things that people do or say or you thought they said or whatever. Be careful about that. Be angry over sin, not just when you're offended. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Fourth thing, give honor and respect to God. What's the whole purpose of worship anyway? It's not about me. You're not here to please me. When you give a gift, it's to God. It's God is the Lord. He's the creator. He's God. He's the one who's the author of the word of God. Uh, he's the one we worship and we serve. It's, the scripture says his disciples remembered it was written... Zeal for your house has eaten me up. How zealous are you for worship? How zealous are you to come into the presence of God? And by the way, I just got to make an aside. It's not in my note. Where's the temple of God now? If you're a believer, you are the temple because he's come to abide with you. He will not ever leave you nor forsake you. That says some really important things. One, I don't come to church to meet with God. 
I come to church to meet with my brothers and sisters to worship God. Because everywhere I go when I leave here, don't think I'm supposed to act holy, holy, holy in this place. But when I leave this place, I can do whatever I want. That's wrong. That's a sin. Everywhere you and I go, guess who's with you? If you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit's with you. God's with you. He'll never leave you and never forsake you. We need to be careful what we're thinking, what we're reading, what we're looking at, what we're saying, what we're doing, wherever we go, because we're the temple and he goes with us. That's good. Aren't you glad God's with you? I am. At Christmas time, when you hear the name Emmanuel, that's the Hebrew name, which means God with us. God is with us, okay? So you're the temple. Anyway, so you should be more zealous of how you and I live, shouldn't we? <laughs> it says, and that came from Psalm 69, because zeal for your house has eaten me up, and reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. So our great offense should be when people are offensive to God, that should bother us, because it's disrespectful to God. <laughs> All right? I don't like people to step on my toes, but that doesn't bother me as much as being offensive to God. And Jesus is angry. What he got angry about was people were being disrespectful of God and also they were inhibiting the people to come freely to worship and try to make money on it. That's wrong. Five, you can trust Jesus. My goodness. If there's anyone in the world that you can ever trust, it's Jesus Christ. He, living in heaven, in the glory of heaven, at the right hand of God the Father, humbled himself, cast off the visible appearance of his glory, came from heaven to earth, was born in a stable, laid in a manger, had to live in a flesh body, the body of flesh. He walked the earth the same as you and I. He experienced heat, cold, hunger, pain, all these things he experienced in his life because he came from heaven and existed in the body of a man. Fully man, but fully God. Can you imagine the humility of Jesus Christ to do that? You can trust Him. Anytime you stop and think about it, there is no other religion, no other false gods in the, in the world that has a creator like Jesus Christ who is so humble that He would come and be one of us in the sense of walking with us and experiencing all the temptations you and I do except he never committed sin, okay? You can trust him. You can trust him. And by the way, he died for you and for me. And it says, what sign do you show to us since you do these things? Remember I spoke last week about signs and I said, you go down the road and you see signs along the side of the road and the signs give you information. They may tell you about a sharp curve that's coming down the road or a steep grade that's coming and you need to gear down if you're a truck driver or whatever. And you, these signs give you information, but you need to keep your eye on the road, not on the signs. And some people get so overwhelmed by signs and sign gifts, they are looking at that as if that's what it's about. And I want to say, get your eyes back on the road and the path God set for you. Get your eyes back on Jesus Christ. The signs are about Jesus. So when he commits a sign, it's evidence that he is God in the flesh. Jesus answered them and he said, Destroy this temple in three days, I'll raise it up. Then the Jews said, It's taken 46 years to build it. How can you raise it in three days? They missed the whole point. He was not talking about the building. He was talking about he was the temple of God. Why? Why? He was the very presence of God himself. What did they come to the temple for? To come before the presence of God in the Holy of Holies. Okay. They had standing before one who was greater than the temple building. He was fully God himself standing before them. And they didn't realize they're talking to the Messiah. They're talking to God himself in the flesh. He's the one. And he was speaking about himself. He was going to be buried and then raised in 30, three days. Just three days. <laughs> anyway, he caused all this commotion that got some attention, but it's interesting to me. He told them that he was going to rebuild it in three days. 
He was just talking about his body, the temple of God. They wanted Jesus to prove that he had authority to do what he did. They were more, wasn't it weird? People get so legalistic about things. They were more concerned about who voted you in? Who put you in the position to be able to tell us what we should or shouldn't do? And they're telling God this. Who elected you to the position of arbiter of what we should or shouldn't do at the temple? They were not concerned about who he is. They were concerned about what's he doing. Who, gave, who told you you could do this? <laughs> I did. <laughs> well, who are you? I am. I am God. Oh. <laughs> and they didn't answer the question. They and people today are always wanting people, to, Jesus to show himself by a sign. And I submit to you that Jesus Christ is greater than the sign. If he can do a sign, he has to have more power than the miracle that he just performed. Yeah, he can perform miracles. Obviously he can. He's God. But it's Jesus Christ we worship, not the miracles. Okay? So don't get focused on gifts. Get focused on the gift giver himself. Anyway, that was an event. When Jesus said to them, to the soldiers, remember in the garden he said, Remember when they came to arrest him later in his life before he goes to the cross at the Garden of Gethsemane or the Garden of Olives and he's in the Garden of Olives and they come to arrest him and he says, who are you seeking? And they all, without a word, fell on the ground. No one can stand before Almighty God himself unless he allows it. No one could stand before Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, unless he allowed them to stand. Period. He's the one they should have been seeking. Instead, they're totally missing the whole point. And I, it's amazing to me. They should have known this because they knew the scripture. Temple. The word temple, it just means dwelling place of God. That's what it is. 1 Corinthians 6 says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit is in you, you when, whom you have from God and you're not your own? So I didn't make that up. That's right in the scripture. It's what it says. You're the temple. And uh, the temple they were standing by was, had been built by Zerubbabel. Remember that? Zerubbabel, that guy? And now King Herod was rebuilding it and remodeling it. And they'd been doing this for 46 years, remodeling this, the temple. And yet the one standing there was, as I said, greater than. In the temple, the fullness of God. And they had God standing there right in front of them. Right in front of their eyes. And I told you the uh, ancient name of the temple, by the way, where they used to worship in a tent. Remember when they were traveling in the wilderness and they had the tent and they set up the tent, mm -hmm. the tabernacle, and it was called the tent of meeting. It was where they came to meet with God. So whether they were traveling and they worshiped God before the tent, the tabernacle, or whether they worshiped God in the temple, they were coming to worship God, not the building. Isn't it so interesting? People start thinking of the building as the holy place. I hope you never do that. It's not the building that's the holy place. It's God himself that make, makes it holy. And he's in you and me. I hope you got that point. Anyway, Jesus cleansed the temple. And uh, by faith, he can cleanse you and me from sin today. Another thing we need to do. Trust God at his every word. Trust his word. It says in verse 21, it says, He was speaking of his temple, the body, his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead later, his disciples remembered he had said this to them and they believed the scripture and the word. I really want to encourage you to read the word of God on a regular basis and I submit to you, it's true, all of it. You can believe it because it's the words of God himself. That's why you know it's true. So listen to him and his voice, okay? <laughs> Search for the truth there, because it's in the Word of God. You don't have to go to the temple to worship God, by the way. You can worship everywhere you are, and I hope and pray that you do. Seven, be sincere in your faith. As I said, 
If you really have true saving faith, it will always result in faithfulness. Doesn't mean we're perfect, but it means that the heart's desire of our, our heart would be to always try to honor God and respect Him and obey Him. And when we don't obey Him, He grabs you and gets your attention and says, Hey, I'm talking to you. Listen to me. Or look, at me, look to me. Stop looking around. Get distracted. Get back to me. So when it says in verse 23 that when he was in Jerusalem at Passover, during the feast, many believed in his name. When they saw the signs, did that stick? Within days they were crying out, crucify him, crucify him. You see, Jesus Christ didn't need to commit himself to them. He knew all men. And he had no need that anyone would testify a man because he knew what's in us. Don't read it as them. Think about yourself. He's the truth. He knows the truth about you. And he knows the truth about me. Many people get touched by signs and miracles. Of course it's amazing. It's something that we can't do. Make your commitment not to the miracles, but the commitment to the miracle giver, Jesus Christ himself. Many of the witnesses and beneficiaries of the miracles were believing only because of the signs. You know, when he made multiplied bread and fed thousands, or he multiplied the fish and fed thousands, or someone was blind and now they could see, or they couldn't speak and now they could talk, or they couldn't walk and now they can run. The same Greek word, by the way, believe in verse 23 also appears in verse 24, because even though some of the people believed in Jesus,